Welcome to the Sufi Reverberations podcast, where each week, God willing, you will be able to hear a poem, a story, a meditation, and a musical interlude that give expression to one Sufi's perspective concerning the mystical dimension of Islam. My name is Anab Whitehouse, and I will be your host. Although I am not a sheikh, nonetheless I did have the opportunity to spend 16 years in the company of a Sufi saint of the 20th century, and by the grace of God was able to gain a few insights into the nature of the Sufi mystical path through that association. So without further delay, let's proceed to the essential contents of this episode. The following is entitled, And That Is Enough For Us. It is an English rendering of a poem by an 11th century mystical saint. It is not hardship we seek nor ease, rather we contend always only for our friend, and that is enough for us. Yet if the friend's nearness comes just through waves of troubled seas, and drowned in trials, let us be and that is enough for us. People seek rewards from God. Our hope is for a perfect faith and test the friend selects, and that is enough for us. Those who are pious save deeds to spend when at heaven's gate. May God alone be our fate, and that is enough for us. Many ask that God fulfill their whims, the need of our heart is you, our end and our start, and that is enough for us. A long life of worldly joy is sought by nearly all. We seek death, my friend, to be free, and that is enough for us. The ceremony is the title of the following story. Every Thursday evening, the same program was set in motion. The friends would gather together at the center and wait for the arrival of their spiritual guide. When she appeared roughly at the same time each week, she would signal for the music to begin. The songs which were selected often varied from one occasion to the next, but they always were intended to help create a state of focused remembering with respect to divinity's presence. She always came dressed in a frock made from white, plain, muslin material. She would stand at the center of a circle formed by the rest of the participants. At a prearranged point, a number of people would bring in a wooden box and set it on the floor next to the teacher. The box was made of unvarnished and unpainted pine wood. Several other individuals would enter the interior of the circle and line the box with various kinds of simple cloth. Another person would sprinkle rose petals into the box. When everything had been properly prepared and the other people had rejoined the circle, the spiritual guide would lower her head, push both hands before her in an outward motion, slowly bring them back to her chest area, and then extend them outward again, as if bringing something into her from the circle as well as passing something back again to the individual surrounding her. Next, she pivoted slightly on her right foot in order to face towards a different part of the circle, and she repeated the previous movement with her hands. The hand movements and the pivoting on her right foot would continue until she had made a rotation back to her original starting point. When the rotation was completed, she would kneel down and kiss the floor with her lips as well as touch it with her forehead. After this, she would rise up, bring her hands to her head, touching first her eyes and then her ears briefly with both hands, and finally cast her hands away in a more or less vertical direction, as if she were throwing something away. After bringing her hands down, she would stand for a moment, head lowered as if in silent prayer. When ready, she would raise her head and walk to the wooden box and lie down in it. 
Several people from the circle would come with a sheet and cover the box. Once this was done, they would return to the circle. With the exception of the music, everything would be quiet for a time. However, after several moments, the music would stop, and people in the circle would begin to sing songs in praise of divinity, oftentimes in unison, but occasionally someone would offer a solo. Usually this portion of things went on for about an hour. When it was done, the people would leave the circle and retire to a room where a meal was served. Near the end of the meal, their guide would join them. She always seemed to be radiating a degree of happiness, peace, contentment, joy, and love above her usual sense of being when she came into the dining hall from the room where she had been laying down. She would eat a little of the prepared food as the rest of the group finished their meal. At the end of the dinner, everyone would stand up and, along with the teacher, offer a traditional prayer of gratitude. When the prayer was finished, the teacher would slowly make the rounds among the tables and gently touch each person on the head or shoulder. Sometimes her hand would linger on someone's head or shoulder, and the teacher would close her eyes and lower her head slightly during this portion of things before she moved on. Following this facet of the program, everyone sat down. The session would be opening to questions for which their guide offered various responses. Although many kinds of queries were raised during these interchanges, sooner or later during the evening someone would ask about the meaning and significance of the ceremony which had preceded the current discussion. Usually the teacher would merely suggest that people reflect on the entire process because her providing ready answers to such questions wasn't always the best means to which to learn, but sometimes she encouraged them to reflect out loud. Over time, numerous possibilities had been suggested in an attempt to explain the ceremony. Some supposed the ceremony was intended to remind everyone present that death awaits us all and is the one true certainty of life. Some individuals believed their guide was trying to teach them how precious life is and that we should take advantage of the opportunity which time offers before it is taken away from us. Other people felt the ceremony was a sort of passion play concerning death and resurrection, with the meal representing the reward which awaits those who have committed their lives to the right sort of principles and actions. A further segment maintained she was reminding the members of the spiritual center that she would not always be with them, but life and the teachings should carry on. Another group of individuals believed the theme of gratitude was prominent throughout the ceremony. Consequently, these people felt the entire evening was intended to help the members of the center to be thankful for all the wonderful things that were encompassed by the gift of life, and especially the gift of spiritual opportunity. Still others considered the ceremony to be an interwoven series of exercises in divine remembrance. The guide listened attentively and appreciatively to all the ideas. However, the people in attendance at these gatherings often sensed that while she indicated the various suggestions given were good ones and embodied valuable insights, none of the pro-offered possibilities really captured the essence of the ceremony's ultimate purpose. On certain occasions, the guide would approach this or that individual to take her place in the ceremony. Such people would be instructed by the teacher about how to do the ceremony, and once selected they were not permitted to reveal anything of what they had been told to the others. There were noticeable differences in how different segments of the selected people reacted to their participation in the ceremony. There were a few who seemed to emulate the teacher. More specifically, after the members of the circle had retired to the dining hall, and when the time came for the individual selected by the teacher to substitute for her in the ceremony would enter the room, these individuals seemed to exhibit the same sort of radiance as the teacher always did. Happy, peaceful, content, joyous, full of life and light. Others who were selected by the teacher did not exhibit such qualities. In fact, they often appeared depressed, anxious, worried, or upset. 
as if an opportunity had been given and lost, and as if they were weighed down by some sort of burden. Irrespective of how a person selected for the ceremony responded, the teacher never displayed any sign of approval or rejection. He treated everyone with equanimity and acceptance. One Thursday evening after the ceremony and the meal following it had been completed, the guide addressed the gathering. Tonight is the last time I will participate in this ceremony. My time on earth is coming to an end. Naturally, the assembly was dismayed to hear this news and were quite shocked. Some began crying. All were quiet and attentive. She continued on. We all knew this time would come for me, just as one day it will come for all of you. However, by the grace of God, we have been able to make good use of some of the treasure trove of time that divinity has allotted us by spending our Thursday evenings together in remembrance, friendship, and the pursuit of bettering our understanding as well as our character, both collectively and individually. As a parting gift to you, I will explain the significance of the ceremony which we have been observing for quite some time now. Of course, some of you already know, to varying degrees, what the ceremony entails with respect to its inner dimensions. Essentially, the ceremony is about letting go. Life weighs us down with emotional baggage. We spend our days enveloped in a steady torrent of troubles created by ourselves because we are not prepared to let go of the pain that we believe others, rightly or wrongly, have inflicted upon us. Instead, we become preoccupied with the slights, rejection, disrespectful attitudes, ridicule, contempt, cruelties, betrayals, insincerity, lies, manipulations, and hypocrisy which people seek to impose on us. Our spiritual path is intended to help us die to ourselves and accept what our Creator has arranged for us, be it sorrowful or joyous, through the acts of other people. We must release both the positive and negative emotions that divine events have engendered in us because, in truth, none of these emotions belongs to us. They have only been loaned to us. When we hold on to them as if they belong to us and as if there were a real us capable of possessing anything, then such emotions begin to poison our attitudes, thinking, understanding, and behavior. We begin to take things personally rather than come to the realization that we are only limited role players in a much bigger drama production than we often suppose, one that is precisely choreographed and which involves no injustice despite what appearances may suggest. As someone once said, there is no such thing as a small role, only small-minded actors. Divinity fully appreciates all of our roles, but divinity also wants us to understand we are but virtual locations through which our roles are being manifested, and then we must let go of whatever transpires, be it joyous or sorrowful. Many of us are like actors who want to hold on to the props and trappings of a play after it has concluded, not understanding that we must prepare ourselves for further stage entrances during ensuing acts of being's play. When we hold on to issues and emotions from previous scenes, sooner or later, this begins to interfere with our ability, not only to perform in the divine drama, but interferes as well with our ability to enjoy the dramaturgical process. So each week I died to myself. I died to my desires, my expectations, my hopes, my moods, my emotions, and my sense of being an independent self or being. We all need to die to ourselves all the time in this manner, but the ceremony offered an opportunity to have the idea begin to permeate our hearts and souls before we face the real final curtain of our lives. When, by the grace of God, we are successful in letting go of all this mental, emotional, biographical, and existential baggage, a tremendous burden is lifted from us. We feel the joy, happiness, peace, 
and contentment that God intended us to experience when we give back to the producer, director, playwright, and chief of the prop department what does not belong to us, as well as openly acknowledge and accept this fundamental fact of existence. As someone once said, we must die before we die. In silence she stood before the group of friends for a while longer, then she waved goodbye, exited stage right, and passed on to the next act. The title of the following musical interlude is Peace. Approximately a decade or so ago, I asked a next-door neighbor of mine by the name of Al if he would be willing to play Amazing Grace on his bagpipes so that I could record it and play it on a podcast. The young man, who has some cognitive challenges, kindly agreed, and the following is what he played on that occasion. Al, thank you, and if you hear this, you are listening to the Sufi Reverberations Podcast. The following essay is entitled, Friend. 
At best, we have only one friend who comes to us in many guises. At worst, we have no friend because we refuse to recognize what lies behind the guises through which divinity is manifested to us. From the moment of our conception, our friend is with us. Our friend is the one who, even before our birth, orchestrated the events which brought our mothers and fathers together and led to our conception, knowing this would be the result. In this way we were given, to the womb of our mothers, a roof over our head and food to eat and a place to sleep before setting one's foot on the face of the earth. Our friend provided these accommodations for us from the treasury of divine names and attributes. Our friend gave us existence and then life. Our friend clothed us with being, consciousness, will, light, hearing, seeing, and speech. All of these were drawn from the divine wardrobe. Our minds and bodies and hearts were constantly nourished and given loving attention by our friend all through our years of development. Whatever benefits we receive from our parents, families, communities, teachers, playmates and schoolmates were all from our friend. These people were but the loci of manifestation to which our friend acted. To whatever extent we can think clearly and insightfully, this is a kindness from our friend. Whatever talents and capacities we have is because our friend wished for us to have them. Whenever we were lonely or sick or in pain, our friend was there listening to us, sending consolations of different kinds through various mediums with which to comfort us. From time to time, our friends sent us care packages of laughter and happiness and people with whom to share our difficulties. Our friend would give us sleep so we could rest from the worries and problems of the world. Our friend provided us with mountains, plains, forests, rivers, lakes, and oceans to give rest to our senses and minds. All of this came from the palette of divine creation and gives expression to the richness, generosity, and subtlety of the care our friend took to provide for us. Jobs, clothes, dwellings, health, opportunities, spouses, children, and gifts all came to us from our friend. We received these not because we deserved them but because our friend befriended us and this is how friends are. Our friend loves to see smiles on our faces and cries when we shed tears. We cannot go through difficulty without our friend being more concerned for our welfare than we are. The breeze which touches our face and feels refreshing is a caress from our friend. The embrace of warmth from the sun is by our friend. The companionship of the moon at night is from the escort service of our friend. The rustling of leaves, the warbling of birds, the sounds of water are all instruments in our friend's musical ensemble which performs all for our listening enjoyment. Our friend is in the rhythms and melodies we hear. Our friend is the hearing itself. The atoms of air which weigh down on us and provide us with the very breath of our life move to the command of our friend. The blood which courses through us and both brings nourishment as well as carries away waste, moves with a tempo set by our friend in our physical hearts. The biological intricacies, harmonies, and order which regulate our lives are all conducted by our friend. The phenomenal precision and sophistication of our brains are conceived and implemented by our friend. Our friend is within us. If we reflect carefully, we can catch traces of the presence of our friend amidst our thoughts. The fabric of our consciousness is woven from thread spun from the divine loom. The conscience, which encourages us and constrains us to be decent, honorable, kind, and just individuals, gives expression to inspirations from our friend. 
the inclination of our hearts towards compassion, mercy, and spiritual knowledge is at the behest of our friend. The one who has shaped and crafted our spirits with the potential for spiritual intimacy and love is our friend. The one who has put longing in our hearts to return to our spiritual origins is our friend. The mystical path with its prophets and saints are courtesy of our friend. The experiences we have on our spiritual journey are none other than signs of our friend. The stations we go through are lessons taught to us by our friend. The spiritual knowledge and understanding which are gained are the colors and lights which glow with our friend's nearness. Our essential capacity and identity bear the signet of our friend. The very mystery at our core is breathed into us by our friend. The one who keeps calling to us to listen is our friend. The one who waits for us patiently is our friend. The one who forgives us for our foolishness and rebellion is our friend. The one who always loves us despite our many faults and shortcomings is our friend. The one who cherishes us and desires nothing but our well-being is our friend. Our friend is both found without us as well as within us. However, the greatest potential for realizing the closeness of our friend is within. To come face to face with our friend requires effort, time, and guidance. Guides have been provided by our friend to help us learn how to struggle and how to make the best use of our time. Sufi masters are the closest we will come to dealing directly with our friend until we fully realize that sacred and sublime presence within ourselves. Sufi masters are the spiritual consolation and support which are provided by our friend until the face-to-face -face meeting can take place. Our friend is present in the Sufi masters in a very special way. Those authentic sheikhs of the path give off the light and love of our friend. Through them, our friend transforms us spiritually. These spiritual guides are the philosopher's stone with which our friend wishes us to associate and thereby benefit from the spiritual alchemical properties that have been infused into them by our friend. When we are in the company of the authentic sheikh, we are in close association with our friend. When the Sufi master provides guidance, it is guidance from our friend. When our spiritual guide shows us love, kindness, generosity, and forbearance, this is being offered from our friend to the spiritual master. The being of the sheikh is saturated in the perfume of our friend because the authentic sheikh is sitting with our friend. We sit with our friend when we sit with the authentic sheikh. The memory of the sheikh which we carry in our minds and hearts is a reflection of our friend. The love we bear for the sheikh is our love for our friend in the form of manifestation of our sheikh. The sheikh and our friend are not two. The former is one of the modes of appearance of the latter. The authentic sheikh is our friend in human disguise. In fact, from the time our souls were placed in our bodies, our friend has been visiting with us through all the circumstances of our lives. All of our experience is a reflection of our friend in some disguise or another. Except for people such as the authentic Sufi masters, most of us do not recognize the presence of our friend in the events of our lives. Most of us have removed our friend from our lives and as a result have impoverished ourselves spiritually. Consequently, we have become lonely, alienated, adrift, separated, and friendless. Nevertheless, our friend still hopes we will clue in to what is actually going on in our lives. Our friend keeps leaving messages for us to call back, but we persist in erasing the overtures. The Sufi masters are here to advise us against this and tell us about the advantages of starting to pick up on the messages being left for us. 
In fact, the authentic sheikhs are telling us we don't have to be restricted to the limited and indirect properties of message systems. Instead, we should develop our capacity for direct dialing access to our friend. You have been listening to the Sufi Reverberations podcast. I hope you will join me next week for a new episode of this program. May peace be your companion. Thank you.